Hello, these are some things in history which have interested me. After Edmund Ironside's death in 1016, Canute has been left with no serious rivals to the English throne. To further secure his grip on that throne, he marries Emma of Normandy, widow of King Athelred. Now, this marriage had two large potential advantages from Canute's point of view. Firstly, it should secure him good relations with the powerful Duchy of Normandy, and secondly, it ought to reassure the existing power structures within England. Emma seems to have been well liked by the Anglo-Saxon nobility, and particularly liked by the Church, of whom she was a noted patron. It did also bring with it one large potential disadvantage. Emma was nearly twice Canute's age, and this might well have made it harder for her to bear him an heir. As it happens, this won't be a problem. Canute and Emma will have two children. But Canute also has a particular reason not to be too worried about this issue, which we'll get to in a moment. Emma won't seemingly have any problem accepting this proposition of marriage. Her two older sons, Edward and Alfred, don't seem to have been a factor in this plan. They're still living with their family in Normandy. History does not record what they thought about their own mother marrying the man who'd driven them from their homes and into exile. That's probably just as well. But why would Canute not be so worried about the prospect of Emma being able to give him a son and heir? Well, the fact that he already had one and a wife. Sort of. In 1014, during his father Sven Forkbeard's invasion of England, Canute had become involved with an Anglo-Saxon noblewoman named Alf Gifu of Northampton, and she'd already given him by this point a son called Svein, named after his grandfather. Was she ever Canute's wife officially? Maybe, but there's no record of such a wedding, and given that the church was later willing to marry Canute and Emma, it's more likely that Alf Gifu of Northampton was Canute's concubine. The term concubine should not be understood with its, all its modern connotations. At this point in time in history, such a relationship would be seen as legitimate, as would the children of such a relationship. This is an example of something that is slowly becoming less and less acceptable. 200 years before this, such an arrangement would have been perfectly normal. 100 years later, and it will definitely be forbidden. These changing standards of social acceptability will leave this relationship without any real parallel in later English history. Kings keeping royal mistresses, that'll be commonplace, the exceptions will be the few kings who don't seem to have had any, but a king actually keeping two queens simultaneously that will never happen again. Canute is wise enough to keep them apart. Alf Gifu holds court in the north of England, and Emma holds court in the south. But these two women are very much aware of each other. Alf Gifu will give Canute two sons, the aforementioned Svein, who in 1030 will be sent to rule Norway in his father's name, managed to lose it in a rebellion, and never return to England, and another son named Harold Harefoot. Emma will give Canute one son, called Harfa Canute, and a daughter named Gunhilda, who will marry the Holy Roman Emperor. In 1018, Canute's older brother Harold dies, and Canute inherits the throne of Denmark. In 1028, he also becomes the King of Norway. He now rules a North Sea Empire. As far as his rule in England goes, Canute proves very effective. He sensibly preserves the existing, sophisticated Anglo-Saxon government systems. He builds up a corps of professional soldiers around himself. He's become known as the Huskarls, the men of his house. And he also encourages marriages between the Anglo-Saxon and Danish nobilities. The most important example of this is a marriage between an Anglo-Saxon noble named Harold Godwin and a Danish noblewoman named Githa Thokelsdottir. By 1020, Harold Godwin will be the Earl of Wessex. Now remember that not that long before this time, the leader of Wessex would have been regarded as a king in his own right. Under a strong king like Canute, Godwin is going to be reigned in. But how will he behave under a weaker king? Either way, his children are going to be important. In 1035, Canute dies while still a relatively young man. How young exactly, we don't know. There's some uncertainty as to the year of his birth. He would probably have been somewhere between his late 30s and his mid 40s. Before we leave him behind though, we do have to talk briefly about the most famous thing about him, the 
story of his battle with the tides. Of all the tales from English history of this period, its only real rival in terms of fame would be Alfred the Great burning the peasant woman's cakes. The earliest versions of this story with Canute have him honestly believing that he can bend the sea to his will, and then feeling humble before the power of God when he realises that he is unable to do so. A later retellings would make Canute a wiser man, deliberately proving his own limitations before the fawning toadies of his court. Sadly, like so many other great stories, it's very unlikely that this one is true. It's not mentioned in anything like a contemporary account, and like the story of Alfred and the Cakes, it's too obviously a fable about the virtue of kingly humility to be regarded as serious history without such an account. After Canute's death, both of his two queens are going to try to put their respective sons on the throne. A Svein Canute's son is going to die mere months after his father, and half the Canute is away ruling in Denmark, so Harold Harefoot is the one best placed to seize power. In this, he's going to be supported by his mother, Alf Gifu of Northampton, and also by the powerful and influential Earl Godwin. What is Emma of Normandy going to do in response? Well, in 1036, Emma's two older sons, Edward and Alfred, who she'd had with the late Athelrad Unrad, set sail from Normandy for England, seemingly at the prompting of their mother. Emma would later try to deny that she'd had anything to do with this, most likely in an effort to absolve herself from any responsibility for what is about to happen. Edward will sensibly set sail back to Normandy pretty quickly, but Alfred lingers in England, only to be captured by that Harold Harefoot supporter, Earl Godwin. Earl Godwin's men massacre Alfred's followers and blind him. As a result of this, he dies. His death itself may have been unintentional. Blinding at this point in history is seen as a way of uh, making a living man ineligible to take a throne. If we look to the Byzantine Emperor at this time, for example, the blinding of rivals to the throne is virtually routine. But whether it's intended or not, Alfred is dead. Four years later, Harold Harefoot dies. Nobody knows why. No more is heard of Alf Gifu of Northampton. Did she predecease her son? Nobody knows that either. But either way, she had no future in English politics without a royal son to support. Hartha Canute returns from Denmark to England and takes the throne with the support of his mother, Emma. But two years later, he also dies, possibly having simply drunk himself into an early grave. So many dead heirs, and nobody left but Edward. Arthur Canute had reached an agreement with King Magnus of Norway that whichever one of them died first would bequeath to the other their lands, but Magnus has no support amongst the English nobility, with the perhaps surprising exception of Edward's mother Emma, seemingly determined to the last to support any claimant above her own eldest son. So once again, Edward sails home to England from Normandy, and on Easter Day 1043, he is crowned king. Perhaps unsurprisingly, he banishes his mother from the court. The most remarkable woman of this period in English history will die in retirement nine years later. Problems loom on the horizon. Edward is already 37 years old, downright elderly to inherit the throne at this period in history. He has neither a wife, nor an immediate heir, and his most important supporter is Earl Godwin, the man responsible for the murder of Edward's brother. None of this bodes well for the future of England. One last little footnote. Somebody whom Edward would almost certainly have seen growing up during his long stay in the Norman court was the illegitimate son of the previous Duke. This boy's name was William, and by this point he's entering his late teens. He is going to have a very big future ahead of him.